everybody to Mess Nyagan Iskwayak. My name is Kayla and we are here for another thrilling episode of the <laughs> Book Women. And I am Tanya. And, and, and I'm Sheila and we're here with our guest uh, Marilyn Dumont. Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Marilyn. I've lived in the Edmonton area now for probably, let's see, about 30 years. Uh, I grew up in Sundry, um, Alberta. My parents were from Kikino Metis Settlement and Onion Lake uh, Reserve. And I teach Indigenous Lit and creative writing here at the UV. And how long have you been writing for? Is it something you've always been doing? No, I wrote as a teenager, but you know, like in a journal. But yeah. the thing is, is that I, I guess I just thought, well, all, all teenagers do this, this, you know, angst venting in a journal or something. So no one took it seriously and neither did I just put it away. And then probably in my 30s, a friend of mine read a little passage from her journal to me and I thought, Dory, that's amazing. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I started writing it in a journal just because I wanted to someday think, oh, I'll read this to one of my friends or family and they'll be taken on this journey with my writing. That's really what my goal was. Yeah. It wasn't to publish. It was to write. Did you keep your, your journals from a teen when you were a or teenager? Or revisit them? I, you know what? About mm, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I had boxes of these journals, and I thought, hmm, do I really want to keep these? Do I really want my family to read these things yeah. when I'm gone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said no, and I chucked them because I thought, I don't want my family to read this when I'm gone or my friends. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of I edited, I kept some, but mostly threw the lot out because I thought this is going to be like an albatross, me carrying these around for the rest of my life, and I don't want to do that. So I got rid of most of them. Mm -hmm. I got rid of my angsty teen journals as soon as I could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I think I only have one teen journal that's still kicking around somewhere in our house. And then actually something that I wrote in a little thing when I was probably about maybe eight years old and I was just so mad at my parents that day, but it's very dramatic. And I was like, oh man, like reading it as an adult, you're like, wow, those issues. Also, <laughs> like when you're a kid and you're like, holy. Yeah. But my angsty teen one, I keep it around because it's so, it's kind of funny to me now almost being like, oh, I thought I had all the world's problems on me, but really they were like very trivial <laughs> compared yeah. to now. And it's just very self-centered, but mm -hmm. I keep that one around, but I'm sure there's probably some other ones that just got you know, talking about boys and mm -hmm. I was in love with my next door neighbor. So I'm pretty sure I destroyed that one when he <laughs> broke up with me. So mm -hmm. I never kept a journal. Well, I, my very first journal was when I was in about grade five when I was really young and I could, I still have it. But what happened was my sister, my older sister, she took my journal and brought it to her school her classroom and read it out loud to all of her friends and it was oh so mortifying. God. I know it was so traumatic so I, I vouched myself never to write my feelings down and I regret that. I regret that a lot. Do you write your feelings down now? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> when I like blast the music and smash my keyboard that's how I do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. do, do you still write in a journal, Marilyn? Yep. yep. Indeed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. Right in front of you, yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah, I still do. I mean, not as much as I used to. All right. Uh, like, before I got this job at the university three years ago, going on four, I wrote a lot more. But just don't. I just don't have the energy or time to do it with the mm -hmm. full-time teaching. Yeah. yeah. It takes a lot out of you, hey? Yeah, it does. A lot. It's the teaching, but it's also the community work. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So for me, I've kind of decided, okay, summertime is when I'm going to be really, you know, hitting my journal and writing rather than trying to do it through the term. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. And I find for me that it's a different kind of time. It's mm -hmm. a different sense of time that you have to be in. You can't be like, oh, I've got a meeting in, in an hour, so I'm going to, I'm going to really work on this poem. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, <laughs> it doesn't really work like that for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. yeah. And I think sometimes too, especially when you are teaching, like I find when Tanya and I teach, sometimes a lot of the emotions that students are feeling, like they start getting reflected on me. And then 
I don't want that to necessarily come out and be reflective of any writing that I'm doing just because like being a bit of an empath with other students and I think and also you get in this weird headspace sometimes uh, especially around exams or when you have to do all the marking of papers and then yeah I'd rather just take the summer to Mm -hmm. you know kind of reflect on myself before having to go into the chaos of September which is coming up soon yes and all the student orientations yes <laughs> yeah. exactly mm-hmm. is there anything that you do Marilyn to prepare for writing or just is there any oh, sort read. of like rituals read. and things that you do yeah lots of reading um like if I want to get back into my writing I'm usually reading a lot first mm-hmm. and then just kind of noodling around mm-hmm. in my journal with different mm-hmm. things but it's interesting that I did I had an old boyfriend who actually gave me some of my poems that I wrote, or some of some of my work, I won't really call them poems, some of my writing that I did when I was like hmm, mid-teens, 13, 14, 15, 16 in there. And when he handed them to me, I thought, and this was just about two years ago, he gave them, oh, gave wow. them back to me, because I, I forgot all about them. I thought, oh, do I really want to read these? I'm not sure. (laughs) Anyways, when I opened it up, it was like, yeah, not one of them was like, that's not bad. Pretty good for... (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I was really surprised. It was like, oh, my God. Like, I had something going there. I don't know what it was, but Uh it was, you know? So one of the three or four of them was like, hey, hey. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Instead of being totally horrified, like, at all of them, right? Right. So Uh, that was good to know. So I know our podcast is about writing, editing, and publishing, and I know that you have many books out. (laughs) Would you be able to tell us a little bit about the the collections that you've written? Yeah, I mean, A Really Good Brown Girl, of course, is still around and being published, and probably will outlast me but you know it's almost it's almost if when you look back at your at your yearbooks mm-hmm. it, that's what it feels like looking back mm. at a really good brown girl sort of looks like maybe move, just moving in maybe to senior high mm-hmm. finish junior high move into senior mm-hmm. high mm-hmm. and so it, it really it, when I look back at them they really do feel like my younger selves yeah because the process of putting them um, together was, well, at different ages, but also, you know, different investigations, different questions that I'm wanting to investigate. So it's it's almost like, yeah, they're different personalities. So yeah. I don't know how else to talk about them other than a really good brown girl really was kind of an adolescent, a very adolescent kind of coming to terms with being Métis in Alberta and and what that meant, and all of the erasure, and um, that kind of thing. So I think that book will be around a lot longer than I am. What did I write after that? I wrote Green Girl Dreams Mountains, um, and that book was written actually when I was doing my master's at UBC. That was really about... Was, I wrote a section there on family that I'm probably most proud of in terms of my poetry. Mm-hmm because I think it deals with some really, really hard, uh, difficult issues around family and how to portray them in a way that is honest but is also compassionate. Yeah. That was a really hard uh, section of that book to write, but I think I'm proud of, proud of that section. That tongue belonging was something I wrote in the process of being writer-in-residence at the University of Alberta, University of Windsor, University of Toronto, and it's there's some poems in there about... Windsor, about Toronto, but also about Indigenous women and the strength of Indigenous women. And then Pemmican Eaters uh, took me into some historical research, reading historical memoirs, reading as much as possible of the time period that I was writing so that I could recreate the language of that time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so Pemmican Eaters was a, it was a different process where I did historical research and then I tried to fashion that into some kind of poetry mm-hmm. and so I'm still on that bent I'm doing research now on indigenous people in Edmonton and then writing poetry about them my next my next book will be about indigenous Edmonton that sounds amazing yeah. I can't wait to read it yeah I'm really I'm really I mean I'm quite happy with it I had quite a breakthrough at Banff when I was there in May and you know I was doing all this research and stuff and I was starting to get just tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter trying to keep 
close to the historical accuracy. And then I said, I'm not a historian. <laughs> I'm a writer. Yeah. So I can do different things with this material. Mm-hmm. So, at, you know, because it really, I really hit a wall. It was like, ugh, I can't, 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 can't. And then all of a sudden it was like, yes, I can. Mm-hmm. I can make them superhuman. I can make them amazing people with you know, horses that fly and, you know, and player pianos that, you know, have murmuration of starlings coming out that turn into dry meat and then fall to the laps of characters' guests. So I can do stuff like that, right? Yeah. So that was a wonderful, wonderful but painful uh, realization. Mm -hmm. For sure. How was your experience at Banff? It sounds like you had a really... Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, Going there for, like, I was there for five weeks... It's fantastic. Wow. People think, well, why do you have to go to Banff to write? Why do you have to do... It's because basically everything is taken care of there. Mm -hmm. Your food is taken care of. Your room is cleaned every day by somebody else if you want. If you want it cleaned. If you don't, just say, don't clean. Leave me alone. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But the other thing that's good there is that people care if you write. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody was, oh, so how was your, you know, your writing this morning? Or what are you working Mm -hmm. on? Because in our general life, nobody asks that. Right. And really, nobody cares if you write or not, right? Mm -hmm. So having that affirmation of a community of people that are focused on their writing is really wonderful to be Mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify for the listeners, that was at uh, the Banff Center for the Arts? Yeah, Banff Center for the Arts. And was it a specific like writer program that you were doing? It was the May Writing Studios where they have resource people. And I've done it before. I've been one of the resource people. And so you can choose to meet with those people or not. It's up to you. I met, I only actually got feedback from one of the people that I was, that was there. But, um, you know, they try to bring in a a variety of writers that may give you some different points of view on things. There were poets there. There were also um, fiction writers. So, yeah, it's it's really great. It's it's very expensive. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But they do have bursaries. Okay. That's nice. Oh, yeah, that's great. Is there a specific eligibility to go? You have to submit a portfolio. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of other things, I don't know, resume, mm. probably project description. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah and there were, about, there were about 30 writers, so there are about 15 nice. poets and then 15 uh, fiction writers. Okay, very cool. Yeah, yeah it is really cool. We and should do something like this at Dainty Crossing. Oh, yeah, for yes, sure. Yes, that wow. would be Yeah, because they have those nice little tents there. I will talk, Just sit there I and look on the river. I will um, Leon this week next weekend not this weekend next weekend because I'm there yeah and I said, surrounded by could we possibly berries. do that yeah as oh. a group of indigenous women writers wouldn't that be great that would be it amazing would. we would love to sh- I mean I think I would be also down for shooting a podcast episode out yeah, there yeah for sure yes yeah I love that idea trapper tips. okay let's do that yes. yeah do you guys want to work on that together as a project we can put money yes and sure I can start writing up we can yeah, we're putting yeah. it out there into the, we are. Into the people universe. are going to know. Gonna we know. said that we would want to do this, but yeah. 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 No, I love that. Métis Crossing is so beautiful. It Taylor is. I took us there last year, and it was so awesome. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, well, my family is kind of from up in that area, mm-hmm. so every year I try and go up there at least once, and we start outside of Redwater, and we take the old Victoria Trail. We printed off, like, the map that they have. Mm-hmm. So we go up there, me and my partner, and we just kind of do a day of, like, mm-hmm. going to all the sites, and we usually go to the graveyards where my ancestors are buried yeah, and mine too. yeah so we go up there we go to the old uh we love driving up to the old cemetery on the very top of the hill because yeah. it's just so fun to drive up there but it's also really interesting because only a few of the actual gravestones are there right. but you can see where the graves are because it's indented because mm-hmm. old graves collapse mm-hmm. so just to think about like who and it's such like a peaceful place and it's like right above the north saskatchewan mm. and yeah. it's uh, it's really beautiful so i love going up there and i like taking people up there because mm-hmm. it's not too far from edmonton and it's just it's a nice trip to do just beautiful. and it's if you nice have time day. stop at the metis crossing stay overnight they have a really nice camp campground yeah. well you know now with that new center they'll have a they'll have a classroom in there oh wow. exciting that could be used just for you know, sharing. Yeah. 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 Performance if you want if people wanted to perform their work at the end of a workshop or whatever. Yeah. Right. Anyways, something to think about. 
Yes, Definitely. exactly. Something to do. Something yeah. to do. Yeah. There you Something go. to do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Done. Okay. Done. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we're both just burning with questions I now. Know, I know. Um, you were talking about a little bit about a kind of responsibility or like accountability to your family in your writing. And I know we had, well, Tanya and I had the privilege of coming out to Black St. Anne and meeting a few of your family members. Mm-hmm. Um, how does kind of your family or like the land that you're from influence your writing or how does it kind of go with your writing or does it? It does. I mean, the Pemmican Eaters and then, well, I mean, all of it, all of it does. Yeah. Um, Because I'm usually writing about place and people and time periods. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like it's all connected in some way. I mean, I'm, I knew less at an earlier age about, about my ancestry in this area. Mm -hmm. So it just seems to get deeper and deeper and kind of more more interesting mm-hmm. and a lot more varied yeah. than what I thought it would have been. You know, so, yeah, so quite an interesting interesting process, getting actually closer to, to the land and to the history. Yeah. Is your family fairly receptive to your writing? They are. Yeah. They are now. Now. <laughs> That's good now. The key word in that sentence. <laughs> yeah. They weren't at first. Yeah. I know that they were. They had problems with a really good brown girl. Mm. Published in 96. And, and I heard some, through the grapevine, yeah. bad stuff about what family, family said about my book. But now they're all happy. Yeah. They're all very yeah. Yeah, pleased and everything. But... But I think that's that's definitely a risk that writers take, mm-hmm. is that if you are going to write, write about yourself, very likely it will include your family, and people have to decide. But I think that's that's one of the things that writers have to decide. Mm-hmm. How, are, how, are, how will you handle it? Mm-hmm. I also had an aunt who contacted me and said, you know, that's, that's not how it was. And I said, well, I have my understanding of it, and you have yours but it ain't changing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's some very good advice, too, um, especially for writers who are going to tell their own story mm-hmm. that, you know, we're accountable to our family, but we're also accountable, like, to ourselves, and we yes. have to follow our truths when we're mm-hmm. saying, when we're telling our stories. But just to know that families, they're either going to love it or, you know, they're mm-hmm. going to have something to say. And Family always has something to say. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's always that one auntie, too, that's like... Mm-hmm. Can't please. You shit, yeah. yeah, that's true. And the thing is, is that people don't realize, like everybody wants to write a book, but nobody knows that it's actually digging trenches and that it's really hard work, like emotionally hard work and also just sitting and putting in the time. It's mm-hmm. tedious, especially when it comes to editing process. So I would say that people always say, oh, I want to write a book. I'll say, okay, are you planning to spend a year doing this? Just even like on a good first draft if you aren't you may not get your book written (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know because it is it's just hard slogging and in some ways I feel sorry for fiction writers because man is there ever a lot of hard slogging if you're a fiction writer oh man the the amount of words and time you put in I just can't believe it yeah it is it's just it's really hard work The, the number of people who have said to me, oh, I want, to, I, I want to write a poetry book. Who do you read? They don't read poetry. Mm. Like, oh, so who's going to read you if you don't read poetry? <laughs> right. But it's, but it's true. Yeah. Like, many, many people want to write a book because I've been, and I've had this experience over and over and over as the writer in residence. So many people want to write books. Okay, you're willing to put in the work? No, I just want to. I just want to have it. <laughs> they don't want to actually put in the work, but uh-huh. they want to publish something. Yeah, yeah exactly. You and know. the publishing process is huge too. Like it's so many different stages. It's different stages, and the whole publishing industry has changed. I mean, when I when I published a really good brown girl, there were many independent publishers in Canada, which has now been reduced to few, being bought up by conglomerates, and then the people who publish poetry don't make a profit. If they break even, they're happy. If you sell 500 books of poetry in Canada, that's a big deal. Then publishers are happy. So the writing and publishing of poetry is just becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. But, you know, the thing is, in terms of Indigenous Lit right now, it's kind of, it's got cachet. 
So there's books being published that probably shouldn't be published, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I've read some of those. Yeah, just really, it's just sort of thing, wow, I wish you would have had a better editor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because the editor can send people back and say, listen, you need to re reinvest in this because it's not saying anything new. There's new, not the language isn't challenging. Yeah, the whole the whole world of publishing has changed dramatically, and it's also moved from where the uh, publisher was most in- instrumental in the distribution and publicity, and now it's gone to the writer. They want you to have Twitter and Facebook accounts, mm-hmm. like publishers want writers to have those, because you are the ones basically promoting your work. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas before, the publisher did all the work, right? Right. As if you don't have enough to do, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's right. But also, a distribution is huge. Like, the other thing about writing books is that people can write a book, but it'll be a doorstop unless it's distributed, right? Mm-hmm. And you have to find a good distributor. And the thing is, publishers don't always have good distributors. So you have to also find a publisher that is very active in distributing books. Like... Brick Books, I was, it was a godsend. It was a mm-hmm. gift for me to publish first with Brick Books because they promote, 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 and they promoted me. Mm-hmm. They put me, on, they did a book tour when I, in 96, 97. Poetry publishers do not do book tours anymore. Mm-hmm. You'd be very surprised. It's very rare because they just have, they don't have the money for it. So, yeah, publishing is, is really, it's really changed. It's nice to see that there are some more Indigenous publishers and that publishers are also now taking the idea of Aboriginal editors a little bit more seriously um, than they were before. Five, ten years ago, they were not interested in in Aboriginal editors. Mm -hmm. I know that... That's another... That's a question that I actually wanted to ask you because I know that you've... In the books that you've published, I think... Was it Pemmican Eaters that you published with um, an Indigenous publishing house? No, nope. that, that one is ECW. I published uh, that Tongue Belonging with Kagadon's Press. Okay. An Indigenous Press, yeah. Did you notice any difference working with an Indigenous Press versus a non-Indigenous Press? Well, what's noticeable is the size of the press, mm-hmm. rather than whether they're Indigenous or not. I mean, the size of the press, uh, they're always struggling. And just, they're hand to mouth. They have no money for extra anything unless they apply for money. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, small, stru- small publishers are basically, they're like home-based businesses, basically. Mm-hmm. And so are many of our literary journals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know we are talking a, a lot about a really good brown girl, and I know that that's actually made the, comp- the comprehensive exam list for the PhD mm-hmm. students. Are you so reading it yet? I've already. Oh, okay. Long ago. You're like, I already <laughs> read that. Peoples and Plays was my favorite list. So that what list are you on now, just out of curiosity? Which one did you leave to the very end? <laughs> Governance. Of that's the worst, the worst one, but that's <sighs> another story. I guess my, my question is, like, how does it feel as, as a writer and an author, like, Having other people read and go through your book and pull out all these, like, I don't know, almost like, I don't want to say nitpicking, but looking and analyzing your book, how does that feel? Because for me, I feel like that'd be really awkward. It is awkward, and I I prefer not to hear about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I, I, it's interesting because it's happened ever since it was published. Yeah. You know, like, academics are looking at the yeah. work, and they're always, you know, saying stuff some of it's you know pretty spot on and sound and some of it's kind of ridiculous so I don't listen to it anymore yeah. basically I mean it, when I stopped listening to it was this around this story what happened is that in the front of the book there's a picture of me and my mother and it was taken by a street photographer so he just snapped the picture I don't think he had any you know any real plans for for the photo well anyway somebody had indic- some wrote this argument that because they couldn't see our feet in the photograph, my mother and my feet, that somehow we were, this represented our dislocation from the land. It was, I was like, okay, that's really pushing it. So, I, so at that point I thought, I'm not reading any more of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the better, protect your spirit. Yeah, right. Yeah. When people just get way too into your into it. You're like, I didn't mean that. No, at I didn't. All. I didn't like, mean that at all. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, 
It's a photograph. I didn't even take it. Mm-hmm. And the photograph yeah. is taken that split second. Yeah. I don't think the guy decided at that point, oh, I'm going to cut their feet off so it will make them look dislocated from the lab. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I kind of stopped reading it. But, you know, in some ways it doesn't really matter what other people think. Mm-hmm. In many ways it doesn't. I mean, I wrote it. It's there. It's that time and period, and it's not going to please everybody. And no, it wasn't your experience, but it was mine. That's the way I look at it. I can't write a book for other people you know, other people. They have to take what they can from it and leave the rest. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, my experience is quite different from other people's. Yeah. Do you Um, teach your own books in uh, in your classes? (laughs) This is always a question that comes up for us. Like, when we do our syllabus, we're like, do we have them read something that we wrote? Do we have them listen to it? Because this year we actually are including podcasts and just, like, alternative forms of learning or, like... um, supplementary to readings and I'm just like and that was one of the questions Tanya had like do they listen to us talking in a podcast I was like I don't know if students want to hear us that many hours (laughs) (laughs) also like there's a few like we we do have them read a journal article that we wrote many years ago and but it's more of like we don't even like the articles, so mm-hmm. we want to hear how much they don't like the articles. So. Yeah, and it's fun for them to poke at us a little yeah. bit. So we save it till the end so they're comfortable with us, and they can just give us all the... Yeah, oh, yeah they tell oh, us how oh, shitty man. our article is, and we just sit there and take it. <laughs> oh, man. So. No, it just, it, it's just not It's not a fair setup mm. yeah. no. to have your own books there. I mean, well, you know why. I mean, it just doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah, it's an extreme power dynamic, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. lots of profs do it. They assign their own books that they've written. I mean, I could understand if there's only one book in a particular subject, they're just the mm. one, but yeah. otherwise, I don't know. I think. It's I mean, it might odd. be different if you were an editor, you were an editor mm-hmm. of a book. Sure. You know, that's, that's a little bit more removed so that you could test people on maybe another writer that's in the collection, mm-hmm. but yeah. what, test them on your own work, I don't. So how would you Python-ish? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you don't cite it properly or, yeah. yeah. I'm here for an argument? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> I won't argue. <laughs> um, so I was just want, in thinking about this, how do you approach teaching creative writing for other people? Mostly, it's really through a process of not so much teaching it as making a space available for reading of others, discussion of their work, looking at technique, and also just being really aware of a person's kind of style or, you know, content, interest, and just like hands off in that area. Mm -hmm. Just hands off, let them explore, discover, come to their own voice, not my voice, their voice. I think it has a lot to do with I think humility, but I also think it has to do with respecting respecting other people and their own experience. So for the creative writing course here at the university that you teach, is it one where students have to submit a portfolio before? Is it that course? Okay. No, no. Well, well we stopped doing that. We don't oh, have portfolios anymore okay. in the right program, but they used to have portfolios. Okay. I will sometime... Uh, ask for a writing sample if somebody has not done any creative writing courses Mm. but not always have you ever ventured Marilyn into audiobook versions of your books actually no I haven't but well I've been recorded a fair amount of time but there's no kind of complete audiobook it's funny because I'm interested in sound and so I'm surprised that I haven't done this but I've often thought about it just haven't had the time and maybe just not as comfortable with the medium but I I really like it when there's kind of I can work with a musician and there's been a couple times where I've done that one with Chris Dirksen which is fantastic and another group of francophone writers at the festival in um, Trois-Rivières they had a kind of a setup with uh, a real like a real xylophone Mm -hmm. um, and drums and something else I can't remember but yeah it was it was great I loved it but I don't know. I just have... It's just not something I've organized or put enough effort into. So what are you looking into for sound? 
I just, I mean, sound, the reason I, I say I'm interested in sound is because poetry has so much to do with sound, mm -hmm. but a lot of people just overlook that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it stems back to, you know, like to the origins of poetry, which were, you know, like <laughs> spoken word, it's oral performance, it's, you know, the bards, it's all of, all of those things where, where it was music, speaking was music. That's, that's why I'm interested in sound. I mean, I, I, one of the things I do teach is that, you know, it's not only the, the sense of the word, but the sound of the word that you're after mm. in the process of putting a poem together. Because basically you're, you're composing music mm -hmm. out of some signifiers that mean something, but you are creating a musical score. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that. I don't have a background in music or anything. It's just a matter of, you know, uh, trial and error. Like I, you know, write something uh, that need, where it needs to change. I try another word. Oh, that doesn't quite work. Oh, I change the whole line. Oh, that doesn't quite work. Oh, I change the whole stanza. That doesn't quite work. Oh, I change the whole poem. Oh, I'm getting closer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it's all, it's for me, I'm, I'm working towards melody as much as uh, sense. I feel like I just saw something of you working with like a local group from Edmonton or you're reading poetry. Yeah. Yeah. It, what are they called? Ne Nehiawak. Nehiawak. Yeah. And I saw that and I was like, oh, that's because they're, yeah. What style of music do they do again? They're not. It's kind of like avant-garde. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting. It's experimental. Yeah. Yeah. I saw uh, like a YouTube video and I was like, oh, that's really cool. It was fun. It was really fun. I mean, yeah. it's a lot of work because I just, oh, yeah. wow, the way they shot that was crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. Because what happened is that they recorded me. How the hell did they do this again? They recorded my voice and then they shot the video. And then they had to match the, try to match the two up mm -hmm. oh. with me sitting there mouthing my previous recording. So we did that. We took that shot 20 times. <laughs> it was crazy the way it was shot. Yeah. yeah. But because it was all, it was, you know, mm -hmm. it was kind of put together after, as an afterthought. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it ended up working and, and Connor did a fantastic job. Oh, Connor, yeah. Connor McNally. Yeah. He did an amazing job. Yeah, that he's is great. really hard to do. Yes. That's why we, I was like, oh, God, will we ever finish this thing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I like to, con you know what? I like to credit Connor for being one of the reasons that we're sitting here doing this book. This yeah. Episode. Oh, actually, God. the reason why, yeah. we, why we created a podcast. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Because cool. it was, a, honestly, it was originally supposed to be a video series, and I was supposed to interview 10 authors. Um, and then publish the videos about it. And I wanted to hire an indigenous filmmaker. Right. And I asked, I don't know, I asked around and obviously Connor's name came up and I met with Connor for a coffee and he basically told me, you can't afford me for this price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this yeah, is this way lot. too, oh, yeah. way too little money for me to do this. And that's fair. And I'm glad that he did that. Because making so. videos is so expensive, but also mm -hmm. like, Connor's done so much work mm -hmm. and like he deserves to be paid like any indigenous person mm -hmm. he deserves yeah, to be course. paid fairly mm -hmm. yeah. and podcasting like a video series would have been great but I think podcasting has turned out to be something that's just um it seems like a better personal, medium for yeah. it yeah. yeah 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 it's been great I worked in video production and it is a tremendous amount of work oh yeah for sure I spent a year on on three 20 minute sections this is so much work, it's unbelievable. And yeah. it's so expensive. It used to yeah. be a lot more expensive because people had to go into a studio, mm -hmm. a post-production studio to get it done. Mm -hmm. And those things cost, it cost, it used to cost like so much money. Yeah. yeah. But now people can pretty much do it themselves with all that computer yeah. technology. But you know, the days I did it, man, we used to have to rent those post-production places and they were like unbelievably expensive yeah mm -hmm. yeah i find in video to be way more intimidating than sound i don't know like i do not want to watch the it's hard for me to listen to the weird things that i do with my voice over and over again but then to watch me act really weird at the same time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like, it's like, oh no! Like, yeah. and then you start to see all your mannerisms, your fidgets. Yes, exactly. like, oh, like, oh. Yeah, exactly. I, I felt weird doing that, and 
clearly I am weird. Yeah. Just painful. It's like when you're at a conference or doing anything and somebody captures a photo of you and you don't oh. know that it's happening. You're like, why do I look so angry right now? Yeah. Or like, I must be really bored. Like yeah, something's right. happening. Why am I rolling my eyes? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And you're like, oh no. Especially when that ends up on like, Twitter or something like that and they're like Kayla's at this conference and it's a photo of me rolling my eyes or just looking angry I'm like why would you choose to put that one up there like I'm sure that I took I'm sure my face did not look like that for the whole entire hour like, like I hope it not. did then something is wrong <laughs> you should have stopped this conversation immediately yeah like, yeah I know so if you do an audio recording, do you think you would want to read it or would you get somebody to read one of your books? No, I'd, re- I'd read it. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd prefer to read it, I think, Yeah. have someone else read it. It's so strange to have someone else read my work. It's like, oh, that's not my poem. It's just mm-hmm. because, because the sound and sense yeah. are so connected, Yeah. it's really hard to have someone else read it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more, like... It's more personal when the author is actually reading it because that's their words, their thoughts. So, yeah. but I have heard audiobooks that are like it's just a random person reading it, and oh, it's weird. Yeah, it's not as good. It almost seems no. monotone, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. A big audio. I'm an audio learner. <laughs> that's what I learned oh, the most, okay. which makes me the worst librarian ever. But yeah, I've, I've <laughs> listened to a lot of audiobooks, and some of them are terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like a robot listening. You're listening to a robot, and they have no emotions or whatever. And uh-huh. Yeah, which would would not be good for your books. No, mm-hmm. right. But then there's some audiobooks where you're listening to it, and you're like, I didn't know that that person's name was pronounced that way. <laughs> or you think yeah, that that's somebody right. reads with like an like somebody speaks with an accent or something like that, and then it just for me, then it just destroys the whole book. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you come up with so many things in your mind and. I remember when they did the Hobbit movies because I'm a huge like Tolkien fan, and um, I think Smog is a male, and I was like, no, Smog is a female. Like that's always how I read the dragon was being oh. a female, not a male. So when they did the in the movie adaptation, the dragon was a male. I'm like, this is completely wrong because that female <laughs> on that pile of gold, that's a dragon. Like that dragon is a girl. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I had like, and then my husband's like, it's a dragon. It can be whatever it wants to be. But the whole time watching the movie, just could not get past that. So I think, yeah. I just wanted to go back to this work in progress about Indigenous Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's anything in your process of like preparing to write it or writing and researching, what has surprised you about Indigenous Edmonton? I don't know if it's, it hasn't been really surprise. I I can't say it's been a surprise. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised that, you know, Indigenous people were part of the thriving, stratified, socially stratified community that was here. Right. You know, right from the very beginning. So, no, it doesn't surprise me, actually. I mean, I, no. Okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. No surprises. Well, is there anything that you would want people to know about Indigenous Edmonton? Well, some of the, some yeah, of the things I find really interesting, um, Victoria Bel, uh, Belcourt Callahu, she was one of the first people to have a player piano in this area and they were I mean they were they were entrepreneurs her and her husband were mm-hmm. entrepreneurs they had a hotel they had a pool hall they had a farm you know and yeah and she had this house with a player piano in it and I was like wow really mm-hmm. and so for me it was just uh, it really you know piqued my imagination thinking wow like what did she play on that player piano and who was there and you know that kind of thing so mm-hmm. so those kinds of things are, are I find very interesting but I don't know if it's so much surprising yeah like, yeah. yeah I think your your book will be a good medium for some people who just want to learn more about like the indigenous history of Edmonton but it's a great like form that's not you know going to the museum or reading a history mm-hmm. book that's super academic and mm-hmm. con in content because I mean I'll read those books if I'm taking a history course but mm-hmm. I would rather you know, read something that's a little bit lighter or just not so intense. More accessible. Yeah, yeah more, accessible. Yeah. more accessible, right? Because mm-hmm. we were we were having a conversation about like the way that academics write and how it's not accessible for everybody. And I think even the way academics speak is not mm-hmm. accessible. And there's sometimes that it goes over my head or when we were talking about overthinking things where I'm like, no, you're really reading into that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, 
like community members, including myself, are just, it's not so complex. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm very excited to read your book because I love history. So mm -hmm. I cannot I think wait. about that player piano. I don't know why, but in my head, just because ghosts are, I, ghosts are a part of my life. And I just imagine this player piano just starting to play randomly all the time. Oh, yeah. And it would scare the shit out of me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like when the shower starts, but it's a yeah. player piano playing. I don't mm -hmm. know why my mind went that way, but it did. Marilyn, I. We have, I guess, two final questions to ask. Oh, okay. The first question is, would you have any advice for people working in the editing and publishing industry on how to work respectfully with Indigenous peoples? Yeah. <laughs> Huge question. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I, I, I don't think I can have any kind of umbrella statement. It really depends on the on the group, right? Mm -hmm. and the cultural group that the person is they're writing about. Uh, I think it really has a lot to do with that. Yeah. You know, what are their protocols? What are the, you know? What's their territory? Or what's their conflict with another indigenous group that is also claiming that territory? Mm -hmm. You know, like they have to be mindful of these kinds of things. And so, I guess I would say, go and do the research. Go and talk to indigenous people in the area where this book is set or somebody that has some kind of information about it that's indigenous <laughs> and that is indigenous in terms of being in the community yeah. you know because people can get indigenous people and they don't have any connection to the community that doesn't help it doesn't it help doesn't. right so then i guess the last question what or is do you have any advice for any indigenous folks who are wanting to get into the publishing editing and writing of indigenous stories and storytelling okay. Read. Read, read, read. Read as much as possible. Read widely. Read the, you know, contemporary as well as, as the older work. Um, because it, what's happening now is that people are more focused on contemporary work mm -hmm. and they forget about people like Jeanette Armstrong, mm -hmm. um, Lee Miracle, Maria Campbell. Indeed, these people <laughs> cut a wide swath for us. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want them to be acknowledged. But right now, the, the focus is really on the more contemporary stuff, mm -hmm. and which is great. But I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that there are people who allowed me to be able to publish my work yeah. and get it out there. Can't lose sight of the Métis aunties. No, oh, yes, absolutely right. not. Oh my God, no, mm -hmm. no. I mean, I I remember like going. Jeanette Armstrong has been a really She's been a real role model for me as someone who is really um, very strongly connected to her community mm -hmm. and has been someone who basically, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a real model for me of how to carry myself, how to be in my own community, um, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So read and get yourself a mentor if you yeah, can. Read as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Read poetry if you want to write poetry. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's good. I know. That's right. very good advice. So, unless we have any other burning, pressing questions, does anyone? No? Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. for being here, Marilyn. We're very excited yeah. to have you on as our last guest of Miss Nyga Nisquiak, Book Women for season the one. year season one Fantastic. season one we'll have one more episode about our favorite moments of the year and just reflecting back so keep your ears open for that one and your eyes watching our twitter <laughs> and facebook and just about everything else that we have also look forward for some exciting things that we will be doing in the fall that we'll talk about later and some possible merch collaborations that will be coming out eventually. So yeah, <laughs> if we ever get this graphics thing down, like that's another thing. Um, yeah, so I guess Métis Perfect. Auntie's out for the day and have a great whatever your day is, your afternoon, morning, evening, whenever you're listening to this. <laughs>